Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to East Central Missouri and the world, and welcome to the James Strong Show podcast, podcast number 360. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for making us a part of your day. I appreciate it. This podcast was recorded on the morning of Saturday, Sunday, not Saturday, Sunday, May the 12th, from the James Strong Studio in Western St. Charles County. Green versus green. That's the topic of today's podcast. Um, And by green versus green, I mean money versus the ecology. Uh, It almost seems like if you listen to the extreme dyed-in-the-wool capitalist or if you listen to the extreme dyed-in-the-wool conservationist, one says money is evil, it's all about the ecology. The other one says the ecology doesn't matter, it's all about the money. Um, Of course, as almost always, the... uh, the best solution for most people is somewhere in between. But these are two groups you cannot speak. uh, They cannot speak to each other uh, civilly because it's the environment versus extreme capitalism is you have as much chance of them agreeing as uh, the pro abortionists versus the pro-lifers it's just not going to happen because they are diametrically opposed uh but when it comes to the ecology when it comes to money uh it's imperative that they all get together because the dirty little secret is money drives the world money drives the ecology money drives the economy money drives everything uh because without money you're not going to have green anything Uh, All your, you want to have green everything? Okay, fine. Uh, We're going to go back to being hunters, gatherers, and be very green and live in caves. Okay. Um, Eight billion people cannot survive that way. So immediately, 99% of the people who live in this world will die. Okay. So you can't go totally green. It's silly. But then to say, let's go ahead and just make all the money we can and the uh, ecology be damned. Well, you can't do that either because (laughs) if you can't breathe the air and if you can't drink the water, it doesn't matter how much gold you have in the, in the bank, you can't live. So the the good solution is somewhere in between. And we're going to talk about that. Uh, We're going to touch on it when it comes to cars. Of course, I love to talk about cars in a way where that's how I'm going to do the intro. Then we're going to talk about a, uh, an emerging economy, a truly emerging economy. We're not, that's not China. Okay. And then we're going to talk about where it really matters. And that is in the good old U S of a, and you can say what you want. Uh, I would say in fact, by statistics alone, uh, Well over 90% of my listeners are from the U.S. A little less than 10% are international, okay? Uh, So to that less than 10%, to that 8 or 9% of my international listeners, please do not take any offense to this. But I think that each and every one of you will agree that the economy of the United States dwarfs anything else that's out there and is the most important. Uh, I will also say that... uh, if you're from an interna- a country other than the U.S., if you're an international listener, uh, consider take the United States out of your market and see where your economy goes. See, that's what I'm talking about. Anyway, green versus green, the money versus the ecology, the topic of today's podcast. Let's start out with uh, a sad note. I guess I guess it's a sad note. It kind of isn't. It kind of isn't. Um, the Chevy Malibu will be no more. That's right. They're doing away with it. General Motors is saying goodbye to the Chevy Malibu after selling more than 10 million Malibu cars worldwide over several decades, starting in the 1960s, so more than several. The automaker said Wednesday of last week that it would stop making the sedan in November 2024. Now, GM said the decision will make room in the Kansas City, Kansas plant for its approximately $390 million investment for an updated Chevy Bolt electric vehicle. Remember the Chevy Bolt one they used to make, then they stopped making it because they 
they caught on fire like a tinder box. Well, GM did shut down its bolt line in April of uh, 2023, but they said in July of this year, of last year, that uh, they would reintroduce it, and they are in Kansas City, Kansas. In fact, the retooling of the Kansas plant is part of General Motors' bet on EVs, a driving force in the company in recent years. Under the leadership of CEO Mary Barra, GM went all in on EVs, uh, largely bypassing the hybrid market. Uh, by, by, by But the company faced manufacturing delays, technical obstacles, and recently weaker than expected EV demand. Now, GM said last month that it's on track to produce 20, or I'm sorry, 200 to 300,000 EVs in North America this year. Okay, so they're making a lot of them, but is anybody buying them? But Malibu's exit means the Corvette is the only gas-powered car that General Motors will be making. Because last year, it announced that uh, the end of this year, 2024, they're not going to make any more Camaros. Kind of strange, uh, because General Motors is not going to make any more gasoline-powered cars. Sure, they're going to make the, Camaro, the, the, the Corvette, but that's that's a specialty car. It's a sports car. They've turned it into a super car. In fact, it's a, it's a very cool car. But it's a car that most people will never consider buying uh, because it's it's a $100,000 car, one. Number two, it holds two people and no luggage. Uh, nothing wrong with that car, but it's just a, it's a very specialized car. Um. But they're going to make EV cars. A Chevy Bolt is a car. Uh, it's more of a more of a crossover than a car, but it's it's what people sedans and coupes. That's not what people call cars anymore. The crossovers are what people call cars. It's just I I don't have to like it. It's just the way things are. But that's how the world's changing. Okay, we're going to EVs because EVs everybody knows are much greener. <laughs> At least people say that they're greener. Doesn't matter what they say. Doesn't matter what I think. Uh, what does matter is that uh, no more Malibus, no more cars, and GM is going to start making the Bolt once again. Most Malibus were sold in this country. Uh, many in Canada, some in Europe, some in South America, but primarily in the United States. But the United States is not the only market for the Malibu. In fact, the United States is not the only market, period. In fact, there's lots of markets out there. And one of the fastest growing markets out there also happens to be the world's biggest democracy, India. In fact, India is on the cusp of a long-awaited economic takeoff. At least that's what some people say. Now, America's corporate titans appear to think that that's the case. In fact, J.P. Morgan Chase CEO uh, Jamie Dimon recently praised Prime Minister Modi, for, uh, he's Prime Minister of India, uh, for having done an unbelievable job. Tim Cook, the Apple head, uh, he said that uh, they're going to start making iPhones in India. In fact, they are starting to make iPhones in India. And he called the country an incredibly exciting market. Warren Buffett said India holds unexplored opportunities for Berkshire Hathaway. Elon Musk said he looks forward to visiting India later this year. So how justified is the hype about India getting ready to take off, okay? Well, first, let's go to the positive part, the glass half full portion of the story, okay? Now, the International Monetary Fund estimates that India's economy grew a robust 7.8% in the fiscal year that ended March 31st. Now, you say to yourself, well, China grows that much every year. No, they don't. China says they grow that much every year. Those are their own tainted, uh, ginned-up numbers. This, these are the numbers from the International Monetary Fund. So you think to yourself, well, why doesn't the International Monetary Fund just look at China's economy? <laughs> because they're a communist dictatorship and they will not release data, Okay. India is not a communist di dictatorship. They're a democracy, and they do release the data. So even by China's ginned-up numbers, India is growing much faster than China, 7.8%. Okay. Now, when Mr. Modi first took office, this was in 2014, India was the world's 10th largest economy by GDP, according to market exchange rates. It's now the fifth largest economy. In fact, the United States, China... Germany, Japan, those are the only four countries that have bigger economies than India. 
bigger than England, bigger than anything in South America, bigger than France, bigger than Italy, bigger than Russia, bigger than, well, everybody except the U.S., China, Germany, and Japan. Now, the IMF, the International National Monetary Fund, estimates that by 2027, India will become the world's third largest economy after the U.S. and China by 2027. That's only three years away, folks. Now, India has also dramatically reduced poverty over the last two decades. Now, at a conference uh, on the Indian economy at George Washington University last month, Oxford economist Sabina Alkiri, and I may be mispronouncing her name, estimated that 415 million people in India exited poverty between 2005 and 2021. In fact, by 2016, 27% of Indians were poor, according to uh, the United Nations Developmental Program Multi-Dimensional Poverty Index, which indicates health, education, and living standards. Now, by 2021, this had fallen all the way to 16%. Now, the World Bank takes an even more optimistic view on poverty reduction, estimating that in 2021, despite the pandemic, only actually less than 13% of Indians' population was in extreme poverty. So you think that's fantastic. Until you figure out what they're talking about with extreme poverty. Extreme poverty means you live on less than $2.15 a day. That's the global benchmark, friends, for extreme poverty. Now, uh, Indian economist Surjit Baya and Karen uh, Karen Bossi wrote this year that India has eliminated extreme poverty. Regardless of who you believe, however, there's no doubt that the extreme deprivation, which India was once synonymous, has ended. Okay, this is a big story. Uh, India has been improving, and India continues to improve, and India's going to be the fifth, fourth, third biggest, largest economy soon. It's already the fifth. And you think to yourself, well, then the Indian people are doing quite well. It all depends by which standard you're looking, okay? When we're sitting over here, <laughs> $2 and if you're an Indian and you earn $2 and you earn $3 a day, you're far above the extreme poverty level, okay? Friends, that's more than a cup of coffee costs in this country. And if you make that, you're not in extreme poverty. Because you got to remember that if you if if most people in India you're not leaving you're not even really living in a house okay you don't have plumbing you don't have electricity the three dollars a day what that means is you're not starving to death you've got plenty of rice to eat and you're not going to starve that's what that means now when you compare that to the fact that you used to not have enough rice and you did starve okay that's an improvement but friends all things are relative. Now, I don't mean to uh, belittle the um, uh, the inroads that India has made. They've made incredible inroads, and they will continue to do so. I believe just so just so they keep a a, um, uh, a democracy there in that country. Okay, but what you got to remember is India has over a billion people living there, and when you figure, well, their economy is close to what Japan's is. Well, Japan has a, has less than a hundred million people. So Japan has, India has more than 10 times the people of Japan. It has four times the number of people as the United States. And and it has about the same number of people as China. And Germany, what Germany has 60 million people in it. That's it. So the German economy is, what is that? Uh, One twentieth the size of India almost. And they still have a bigger economy. So you've got to take all that in, into consideration. Uh, there's improvement, and then there's getting there. India is not yet there. Kudos for India for, for improving their economy. In fact, I think they will continue to grow because I think that more and more and more and more companies are going to be looking to India for cheap labor instead of China uh, because in China, they don't tend, I'm sorry, in India, they don't tend to take people who have come into the country and uh, done well. They don't steal their money and throw them in prison and kill them uh, like they do in China. So more people will be going to India 
away from China because uh, the industrialists don't want to have their money taken away from them and be put into prison. But all things are relative. And the economy actually worldwide is, is growing leaps and bounds. And in fact, I've mentioned this before. Um, I, I did a podcast, well, I, I, I lose track of time, but I'm thinking it was at least six months ago, maybe a year ago. And we talked about how the U S economy was rather stagnant. And the reason it was rather stagnant is because what drives an economy is productivity. And productivity is defined by, uh, or increased productivity would be defined by uh, getting more out of the same. Uh, when Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin, you net now could do what it took 20 people to do before, a machine and one man did it now, okay? That is productivity. The Industrial Revolution, you didn't have to make stuff by hand. You had machinery. When Henry Ford invented the car, uh, the average farmer was basically locked to about a, a seven mile radius because he needed to get there and back the same day by horse. And that's about as far as you could go on horse. So you never went further than seven miles from your house. A car lets you go 70 miles from your house. In other words, you could market your product further. You could do more in less time. And productivity now is taking a leap. That's why the stock market is getting better. That's why the economy is getting better. That's why people's lifestyles are getting better. And yes, they are. Don't anybody who tells me, well, no, things aren't as good as they used to be strong. Th things cost more. Things do cost more and people earn more. Truck drivers at Walmart make $100,000 a year. Why did you know that you've got to be make $100,000 a year to get a nice house and fill in the blank area? You know, yeah, okay, I know that. So become a truck driver at Walmart and you can live wherever you want, okay? <laughs> things are changing like things have always changed, okay? But what's changing is this whole technological boom, okay? AI, call it what you will. I mean, AI, th I think, is, is overrated and it's not what they've hyped it up to be, but it is certainly making an improvement over what things were before, okay? Uh, case in point, um, if you want to roll ahead and write a story, let's say a story takes you a day to write. And when I say a story, I mean, uh, if you go to a company website, let's say, and you read about what, what is this company all about? What do they do? What are they all about? What do they offer? Uh, that could take a long time. If you hit the button on the AI, it will write that all for you. Now you have need to go in and edit it and take out the, the dopey words and the, uh, the overstatements to make it right. But for the most part, it does a great job. It really does. Okay. Uh, when I used to edit, I would edit industrial videos and I would go ahead and put in the, um, uh, the subtitles. Okay. All you have to do is hit the AI button and it does that for you. Now you have to go ahead and go in and edit it because it mispronounces some words and that type of thing. But what used to take me hours now takes me minutes. Okay. So AI really does help you out a lot because it increases your productivity. Now, what does AI take? Not people, but what's, what's the definition of work? Uh, taking energy and uh, making something happen. And I'm paraphrasing. If that energy is not somebody walking or running or turning a, a knob, that energy is electricity. And friends, we don't have enough of it in this country or anywhere else. Case in point, Dateline, Atlanta, Georgia. Bill Thompson, he needs power fast. And the problem is that many other business people racing to Georgia need power as well. Uh, I do a lot of business in Georgia. I'll be going there in two weeks. Uh, two weeks? One week? Two weeks? Two weeks. Yeah, I'll be in Georgia in two weeks. Lots of business down there for me, okay? And other people. And the whole southeastern portion of the country. I'll be in North Carolina this week. But Bill Thompson heads uh, marketing and products management for a company called DC Blocks. Now, uh, what do they do? Well, in recent years, they built a string of data centers in mid-sized cities across the fast-growing southeast. Now, the company more recently set its sights on Atlanta. 
the would-be capital of the region, joining a slew of tech and industrial firms piling into the state. Now, vying for a piece of one of America's hottest markets, those businesses tend to have two things in common. The first one, they represent a U.S. economy increasingly driven by advanced manufacturing, cloud computing, and AI, artificial intelligence. Now, the other one is they promise to hover hoover up huge amounts of electricity. In other words, it takes a lot of power to produce this productivity, power meaning electricity. Now, that combination means Georgia's success in luring this development comes from comes with a side effect. Power is a big source of tension. In fact, clean energy goals of companies and governments are running up against the needs for projects to go to break ground fast. In other words, if they, if they want this new company in, they want to start right now. And so far, climate advocates fear that this uh, these imperatives of growth mean more fossil fuels to generate electricity. Now, Georgia's main utility, Georgia Power, they've boosted its demand projections 16-fold and is pushing ahead on a hotly contested plan to burn more natural gas. Now, critics warn it will yield higher bills and unnecessary carbon emissions for decades. Some companies are scrambling to secure, to secure uh, unique renewable energy deals to power their development. Now, one major source of disruption is data centers. Now, these facilities are ballooning, ballooning in size as people spend more of their waking hours online and companies digitize everything from factory processes to fast food drive throughs Yeah, when you do a fast food drive through it doesn't happen magically. It goes through a data center. Sometimes... Sometimes in the Philippines, believe it or not. Yeah, if you, if you go to a drive-in place and you speak your order, a lot of times that goes through the Philippines, a data center. But all that data uh, generation takes energy, takes electricity. And it all requires computing power. And firms like DC Blocks, they lock into it as quickly as possible. Now, generally, said Thompson, remember, he's the head of this uh, DC block company. We find the guys with the fastest power win. In other words, we need more electricity pronto. Similar quandaries are ripping through other hubs of the new American economy, with utilities in Tennessee and the Carolinas forecasting their own unexpected surges in local growth. Now, U.S. power usage is projected to expand 4.7% annually every year. Over the next five years, that's according to a review of federal filings by the consulting firm Grid Strategies. Now, that's up from a previous estimate of 2.6. 2.6 versus 4.7. Friends, that's almost double what they thought it was going to be just a few years ago. Now, projections have come after efficiency gains keep electricity demand roughly flat over the last 15 years. Now, that allowed the power sector to to limit emissions, largely in part through closing the dirty, cold-fired plants. So, as they opened up greener plants and electricity needs were flat, they could close the dirty ones, okay? And for years, if you remember, we kept our energy usage flat because we went from incandescent bulbs to fluorescent bulbs to LED bulbs. Uh, my furnace, I've been in this house for 32 years. My furnace is about four times as efficient as it was 30 years ago. Everything is just so much more efficient. So it's not that we're having to turn the thermostat down to 56 degrees in the wintertime. It's just the ther- that the furnaces are more efficient. Lights are more efficient. Everything is more efficient, Okay. But now we're starting to ramp up because of all the technology that's needed and the technology requires more electricity. In fact, we haven't seen this in a whole generation, says Arnie Olson. He's a senior partner at the consulting firm Energy and Environmental Economies. Now, as an industry, we've almost forgotten how to deal with low growth of this magnitude. Now, for states like Georgia, uh, FOMO, the fear of missing out, could be a once in a generation in, of investments. In other words, these people are going to go somewhere really soon. And not if it's not Georgia, it'll be someplace else. 
Now, Washington is throwing billions of dollars into domestic manufacturing. So once again, they got to find a place to go. Uh, it ain't California because they continue to shut down all kinds of plants. So their electricity is going away. Nobody's moving into California. In fact, they're moving out of California. So they're moving into these areas where the electricity is growing. In fact, an added wrinkle is that this is all happening in many parts of America um, while, they're tr- while these parts of America are trying to wean themselves off of fossil fuels. Now, these companies all have clean energy goals, according to, that's what Patty Duran says. And Patty is a Georgia power critic who's campaigning to be a utility regulator in the state. Those goals are at risk if Georgia power gets what it wants. Now, the Peach, Peach State's energy quandary system, from the type of economic dynamicism that many counterparts would envy. In fact, its growth has been consistently outpaced by the nation. They continue to grow and grow and grow. A smaller portion of Georgia's are jobless than the U.S. average. Their incomes continue to rise faster and faster and faster. In fact, state and local economic development teams have courted large businesses to set up shop and pitch sales that have included generous financial incentives. Rail lines, ports, America's biggest air hub, that's Atlanta, also provide access to faraway customers. Now, Pat Wilson, who's the commissioner of the Georgia Department of Economic Development, said energy is increasingly part of those discussions with newscomers. Now, what's going on in Georgia? Uh, I've talked about this before, and I've been witnessing it for the past 20 years, okay? Uh, There's a new plant down there. It's the plant Vogel, Vogtel, V-O-G-T-L-E, Votley. I'm not sure how that's pronounced. I've heard it pronounced several different ways by all the people down there. It's a new plant just outside of Augusta, and it's America's largest nuclear power plant. Yeah, a new nuclear power plant. Who would have thought? Now, this is a sign that the state is ready for long-term growth. In fact, we have a utility partner, that's Georgia Power, uh, who wants to make sure you can meet your energy needs on day one. That's what that's what uh, the, the news new people are being told by Pat Wilson, who's the commissioner of the Georgia Department of Economic Development. Now, those needs include affordability, reliability, sustainability. Those are for firms like Arubis. Now, who's Arubis, you say? Arubis is a German metals giant building a recycling plant on the outskirts of Augusta, where all this cheap energy is. Now, why would a European plant come to the United States? to build a recycling plant because recycling plants take a lot of energy and U S energy prices are far lower than those in Europe. In fact, if you remember a year or so ago, Europe wasn't sure that they were going to have enough natural gas, which powers electricity to stay warm because they got it from Russia and you can't, it, Russia stopped selling and they stopped buying it because of the Ukraine war. Now that's a boon for Erebus because they use mammoth equipment to shred old circuit boards and electrical wiring and they melt the scraps and they separate the copper from the other materials. They're a very green company, but they use a lot of electricity. And therein lies the rub. You take companies like Erebus who are wanting to come to the United States, provide jobs, recycle stuff, but it takes a lot of electricity. And the green people don't want this because it takes too much electricity. It's bizarre. It's a bizarre situation, folks. In fact, there's a guy, his name is uh, David Schulthus, and he's the president of the Georgia facility. In fact, this the Georgia facility, uh, Erebus. He said, overall sets of projects has to get us there. In other words, we got a lot of things that have to happen in order for us to, to be profitable in the U.S. In fact, the firm has made strides to that. At, the firm has made strides to that end in Europe by bolstering the usage of wind or solar power in a portfolio stretching from Belgium to Bulgaria. Now, in Georgia, Schulthes pointed to plant vote vote votely. Plant Votely, that's the power plant, the nuclear power plant. And in fact, you can see it, it's just 12 miles away as a symbol of reliable energy. In fact, companies prize nuclear power plants since they produce carbon-free energy and unlike wind and solar, they don't depend on the weather. 
fact, if the sun isn't out and the wind doesn't blow, they still produce just as much electricity. But the projected power needs of new businesses in the state far exceed the expected output of the plant's recently added reactors, the second of which went online just last month. They've got two. Now, despite Erebus's proximity to uh, <coughs> the nuclear power plant, which is co-owned by Georgia Power, it's also difficult to trace the source of electricity that reaches the substation on the German company's property nearby. Now, Schulthies instead relies on the utility's overall power production for his carbon accounting, meaning the Georgia site will add more to Erebus's carbon footprint. Now, we get the full grid, the mix of the grid, of what we produce, okay? Now, many of the battles over that energy mix have been fought in a windowless room in one of the imposing government buildings crammed into Atlanta's south downtown area. Now, that's home to meetings of the Georgia Public Service Commission, which oversees the utilities, including Georgia Power. Now, the investor-owned utility last fall made an unusual update to its periodic resource proposal to regulators. Citing a boom in new business customers, Georgia Power boosted its projected demand growth over the next seven years from less than 400 megawatts to 6,600 megawatts, or a third more than the utility's total capacity at the beginning of 2023. A third more. That's huge. Now, to make up the gap, the company put forward a plan that includes adding battery storage, buying powers from power from fusel, fossil fuel plants in Mississippi and Florida, and building three new gas-fired turbines in Georgia. Now, the Southern Company situary, subsidiary since sp sparred with renewable energy-minded organizations as divergent as local municipal governments, the Sierra Club, and the Pentagon. So everybody wants green energy, but everybody wants the recycle plant in, 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 in town too. It's bizarre. Opponents urged the utility should accelerate demand-side responsibility responses, such as allowing customers to dial down energy uses depending on costs. Others propose more aggressive use of solar power and batteries in so-called virtual power plants that allow customers with solar panels to sell energy back to the grid. Now, in Georgia Power's view, adding gas is key to providing stable power and quickly ramping up electricity for moments of peak usage on the hottest days of summer and the coldest days of winter. That's especially crucial given the utility's gradual retirement of coal-fired plants. So if, if, if the need for electricity continues to grow and they want to shut down the coal-fired plants, something else has to give. And if the wind's not blowing and it's nighttime, none of these solar and wind plants are producing anything. Now, some Georgians are skeptical, noting utilities' previous overestimates of demand growth. Power companies have a financial incentive to pursue capital projects, one critic says. And overbuilding now would risk saddling taxpayers, ratepayers, with, with assets that have been decades long on the shelf. In other words, pay for it now because it's coming and it never comes. Now, recent history of energy development in the state has also been rocky. In fact, uh, the Georgia Power-led product to expand the nuclear power plant the first nuclear power plant built in decades, it, it cost more than they thought. How much do you think that thing overran? $30 billion. No, no, it didn't cost $30 billion to build. It cost $30 billion more to build than they thought. And it was years and years behind schedule. In fact, I did a podcast on this several years ago. Um, it had been decades since the nuclear power plant had been built, and these plants require specialized welders to weld the seams on the tubes that transport the water. <clears throat> well, they all retired. Nobody knew how to do it. So they pulled a bunch of 75-year-old men out of retirement and paid them a king's ransom to go to work, okay? But, but that's just part of the problem that they have. Uh, in fact, since the project's early stages in 2007, yes, yeah, when this began, a 12-month moving average of residential power costs to the utilities companies has surged 68%. That's according to the Georgia Center for Energy Solutions. Now, that outpaced inflation as well as costs increased for industrial and commercial customers. 
Price pressures and climate fears have pushed communities such as suburban Atlanta's DeKalb County, which has pledged to slash emissions, to lobby regulators for more aggressive oversight of the investor-owned utility. So here's the other thing. Okay, here's what you have to do. You have to go green, and you can't raise prices. Well, green energy is very expensive, friends. Very expensive. I mean, here where I live in western St. Charles County, we have a co-op, electrical co-op. Now, the majority of power in, in the United States, in, in, in Missouri, is hydro, nuclear, coal, gas. Very little wind, very little solar, okay? It's just not reliable enough. And our utility company, Quiver River, they, they, they put out a notice, said, look, folks, if you want to go ahead and put solar panels on your roof, you can. But here's the math. Based on what we charge for electricity and what it's going to cost you, even with tax deductions for solar panels, you'll never make your money back. You will never be out of the red. Ever, ever, ever. And then you figure that in countries like Canada, where there's not much solar, they have solar panels all over because the electricity is so expensive that it makes sense to do it. California, now granted California has a lot more sun than we do here in Missouri, but in California, it makes sense to buy solar panels for your house because electricity costs 68 cents a kilowatt hour. I think I pay 12 cents, okay? So it costs, so quick, quick the math. What is that, six times as much? Not quite six, five times as much? Yeah, the electricity costs five times as much out there. That's how come they can go to so, to solar. Charge five times what you what you what you charge, and then you're good. You want to find a way to get electric cars to be viable tomorrow? Raise gasoline to twenty dollars a gallon, okay? But that's forcing your hand. It's not letting the market do its thing. As I'm driving into the day job, and I I go over the hill, I can see the smokestack of the Labity coal-fired power plant, largest coal-fired plant in Missouri. It's a big polluter. They've recently put on scrubbers, and it, it pollutes a whole lot less than it did before. Now, long-term, are they going to keep that plant open? No, and they probably need to find a way to, to get cleaner energy. I get it. But for right now, it's a relatively clean form of very cheap energy. And when you talk about people making a hundred thousand families making a hundred thousand dollars a year and having trouble making ends meet, I think the last thing in the world you want to do is is times their electric bill by five. There's all kinds of things we can do. The economy continues to be very strong, in my opinion. Uh, now, those of you who disagree with me, I would challenge you to do this. And, 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 and of course, you know, what's the old adage? Uh, what's the difference between a recession and a depression? A recession is when my neighbor loses his job, and a depression is when I lose my job. So it's whatever is going on in your house. But, friends, if you look at, if you can't make ends meet, and you think the economy is truly bad, here's what I would challenge you to do. Look at your balance sheet. Now, I know you're not a business, you're a home, but you really need to have a balance sheet. And it doesn't matter if you earn 20000 a year, $120,000 a year, or $1.2 million a year. If you spend more than you earn, you're going to be broke. So look at what you earn. Are you really doing everything that you can to earn what you need? And if the answer is yes, then look at what you spend. And before you say, well, I can't possibly cut back on anything, uh, look at the hundreds of dollars you're spending on cable and, and internet. I know you need internet, but cable, okay? Look at your car payments, plural. Look at your house payment. Look at the payment you have on your vacation home. Um, look at your timeshare. Look at your, what, what else do we need? Just look at your credit card bill. Why, 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 don't you, why haven't you paid that balance off? Look at how often you go out to eat. 
I can go on and on and on and on and on. Okay. Things are very good in this country and we eat too much. We drive too much. We do a whole lot of extreme things that if we really looked at it, not even real hard, we could cut back and do great. Dear listeners, we are in the middle of a new industrial revolution. This has to do with the technology boom. This has to do with seeing things going to the cloud. This has to do with AI. This has to do with a lot of things, but it's going to require electricity. And if you've got any of the extremists out there saying we need to shut down all the coal plants and all the natural gas plants, run from them as fast as you can and put the kibosh on them because they will ruin the economy. By the same token, if you've got these capitalist extremists who are saying, look, it doesn't matter about the economy. Who care? Who cares about those stupid fish and birds in the sea? Well, <laughs> again, you've got all the gold in the world, but you can't breathe the air because it's too dirty and you can't drink the water because it's too filthy. It doesn't matter. And again, the solution is something in between. We've got the coal-fired furnaces. Put better scrubbers on them. Gas-powered furnaces. we got more natural gas. We produce more natural gas in this country than anybody else. And while it does have a carbon footprint, compared to coal, it's a rounding error, okay? And natural gas... We, 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 we mine that here. We don't have to import it from China like we do solar panels, okay? Be logical. Be prudent. Do the right thing and just think about things because if we all decide to, to screw our heads on tight and compromise and get along and give a little bit and take a little bit, we're all going to be even better than just fine. Green versus green doesn't have to be the economy versus the ecology. It can be green and green if we do it the right way. Well, that's it. I'm done. James Strong Show at Hotmail.com. That's the email address. Thank you, dear listeners, for your emails. And uh, in fact, I get emails. Sometimes I get texts. Sometimes I get uh, Facebook instant messages. I get all that stuff. And I enjoy all of them. I do respond to each and every one of them. Uh, if I forget to send the email response uh, within a couple of days, it's because I'm busy. But be patient. I will answer, and I do appreciate it. That's all. I'm done. Until next time, this is James Strong saying adios. <laughs>